So, there's no sound this time, then that's a serious issue. Let's see. Well, see, that's the issue, Ghost. I would, if possible, like to not restart the stream. So, okay, there's no confirmation. This time. Okay, we have sound, we have everything. I'm gonna go check the other room. I'm so sorry about all of this. Okay, so anyway, one D is demonettes. Um, what I'm gonna do here is go ahead and, by the way, I'm so sorry for all that. I really didn't wanna restart the stream because then I would have to post a new URL link for all of you and it's just, it's a hassle. But anyway, now that we've got that going, this isn't the brush I wanna use. Um, the brush I'm actually gonna use is I'm gonna pull out one of my other ones, like, one of my cruddy ones, because I'm just going to pull out some, whatchamacallit, Warp Fiend Gray to do the base of their flesh. And I made a new wet palette for this and everything. <laughs> well, I'm glad to hear I'm not the only one with issues, Scorpion, because, I don't know, I just... I got confident enough where I'm like, I don't need to do a test video today. I can just, I'll be fine. OBS and YouTube will work for with me this time. Foolish, foolish me. But you live and you learn. And the more of these I do, the better the quality you'll get so that I never have to go through a process like that again. But anyways, now that I have the Warp Fiend Gray out, watered down on the wet palette, I'm going to use my detail brush and start, go ahead and doing these demonettes. And I'm gonna do all six of them. And I'm gonna do them in a line, and you're gonna see me do one after the other. Each coat. So we're starting with Demonette Flesh. Not Demonette Flesh, I'm sorry. Warp Fiend Gray applied to the Demonette Flesh. <coughs> And wow, um, Chaos Grim just gave us our topic of the day. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and continue to talk about the model before I get into that, because you're all about to see that I'm a nut and I can go on about Evangelion forever, even on the most trivial aspects of Evangelion, such as a, one of the main characters um, and why I like them. But anyway... Uh, these are the Juan Diaz demonettes that I'm about to start on, by the way. So these are currently out of commission. Unfortunately, that means you can't really get that. You can, you have to get them secondhand. You have to buy them online on like eBay and people sell them for literally like 200 plus dollars for 10. It's absurd. So unless you can get really lucky like I did and find them somewhere, you might be a little bit out of luck. Without further ado, I'm going to start going in here. I'm painting the flesh. And, uh, so the question that Chaos asked, which kind of sets our tone for the video today, is why do I like Asuka when she's bad? And I'm going to answer that by saying, one, Asuka isn't bad, or Asuka isn't bad. Your taste is terrible if you don't like Asuka. But that's actually not true. That's just me being bitter. Because I understand why a lot of people don't like Asuka. Because the main characters of Evangelion are inherently unlikable people. And that's kind of the point of the show, in a way. Um, they aren't supposed to be likable people. Because in a way, it's uh, you probably heard this before, it is a deconstruction... But that's not the real reason um, the characters are so utterly unlikable. It's just 
the unlikability of them makes them a little real. And I feel like Hideki Anno was even challenging people to like his main protagonists. And I feel it was also a demonstration how the aspects that people like in a character, for instance, such as a female character, and we can't get away from this comparison, um, he tried to demonstrate how odd, weird, and awkward, and just freaking crazy um, it would be to have the ideal submissive female that was appearing in anime all the time, which is why Rei is so freaking weird. But people didn't respond quite right to that, unfortunately, because his point was, what he was trying to demonstrate is how even though people are flawed and terrible, like Shinji and Asuka, they're still better than your idealized uh, visions of people, like your super, super protagonists and your like ultra-submissive women, because they're real, and they represent some form of reality. That's why at the end of the show, or at the end of the movie... You have Shinji, and I apologize, spoilers, um, reflecting on the fact that he wants to return to reality because in the moment he knew that the people he interacted with were real as opposed to the figments of his imagination that he was interacting with post-third impact. Uh, Rei is indicative of something like that. Rei is like an imaginary character. She is very literally, spoilers again, she is not human. Unlike Asuka and Misato, who even though they are flawed, flawed women with many issues and emotional, like, drawbacks, and they can sometimes be downright a little bit crazy, they're still real, which means Shinji's interactions with them had meaning, and their interactions with Shinji had meaning. So, like... Just to get into that, like, one of the reasons I like Asuka, my whole point of that whole long rant is that Asuka is a very realistic character, and she's very relatable. She's not an idealistic person, but nobody really is. Like, so I really empathize with that. But within Evangelion, all the characters are like that, and I'm done with her. I got her flesh done. We're moving on to the next one. <laughs> So, I guess so. Uh, I guess I'm getting a little too into the or into the philosophical aspect of it. Uh, Chaos just brings up Oscar never won a battle. Worse than Shinji. Um, yeah, Oscar's inferiority to Shinji is a theme throughout the show, and that's what leads to her breakdown. Uh, I don't really judge fictional characters based on their power levels because the author sets the power level and it's meaningless. Uh, in reality, I prefer a more mundane character that struggles more because that means it took more, one, it took more effort on the author's part, two, it's more relatable, three, I mean, it's just, it's, they're just characters and I don't want to point anything out because I don't want to insult your suit or your favorite character or something, but when a character is so powerful that the only thing that restricts them is like, like they literally are as powerful as the plot requires, it just becomes meaningless. So like in regards to Asuka losing more robot fights than Shinji, like, I don't care. Why would you care? It's completely meaningless. It's something arbitrary set by the author. In Evangelion, more than like almost any other robot show, if you can even call Evangelion a robot show, spoiler again, um, Sorry, I'm just trying to focus. I'm, like, sitting here randing instead of getting onto the demonette, but... Even though Asuka never wins a fight that serves to build her character, as she realizes that she cannot fight her way through life, and she cannot exist on her own as desperately as she wishes to, and that serves her character arc, where Shinji's is a little bit different. Shinji has to come to terms with the fact that he is the only person who can help people, even though he doesn't want to. Literally, he has to save the world, and he doesn't want to. Whereas Asuka would love to save the world, but she's completely incapable. Real best character is Pen Pen. You know, I actually had an ex-boyfriend who would say that to me to troll me. I would say stuff like, who's your favorite character? In like an attempt to psychoanalyze them to be like, hmm, why do you like that character over this character? And he would troll me super hard by being like, Pen Pen best character. 
Pen Pen was actually the starter of Third Impact. Uh, that's spoilers. You're not supposed to tell him that, Chaos. But seriously, if you all haven't watched Evangelion, it's a very interesting psycho, well, I don't know if psycho act or psychoanalytical is the word I wanted to say, but it's a very interesting show with a lot of very relatable characters. And I think Asuka and Shinji are two of the most relatable, specifically because they are pathetic, because in all of our hearts, we all really do think we're all, <laughs> we all really are very hard on ourselves. And none of us are that, like, idealistic hero from, like, a fantasy story. Like... <clears throat> no one does things without struggle. And, like, I don't know, it's just the way that Evangelion's characters aren't so idealistic and perfect, it's just... It just was very realistic to me, and it was handled in, a, like, a very human way. I name you... You want me to name you a better character than Pen Pen? Um... I don't know, you got me there. Pen Pen is pretty much awesome. Like, I used to resist that argument, but I guess I just have to accept it. The Penguin is the best character. Stupid Penguin that makes no sense. Okay, there's this girl's flesh done. Got her hands, her feet. Uh, this foot looks like it can use some on this side. But really, Oscar's my favorite character because I like I find her the most relatable personally. When I was that age, I was extremely angry. I was extremely mean. I had low patience. I was very desperate to try to prove myself and show that I was the best. When in reality, eh, I'm kind of a mook. Which is the reason I wanted to paint these. I was debating between the rhino and the, uh, and doing some of these. And the reason, like, I chose to do these is because I was just painting the Lady of Depravity and that Herald. It was like, I just painted two characters. I need to paint some mooks. Just some regular girls. I thought maybe I would do, like, this sorcerer character for Chaos Space Marines, but I decided against it because, like, I don't know. Um, I'm kind of sick of doing the pink for my Space Marines, and I know that's weird because I haven't done any on this channel, but I've done a lot of that same pink for my Space Marines, and it's like I have so many unpainted demonettes in comparison to, so this is really the part of my army that I need to get painted right now. I've only got, right now, I don't even think I have 20 painted demonettes, so I really have to step up. Get this done. I think once I get her face here, that'll be the end of this one. I'm just double checking her over to make sure I got it and we're good there. Pulling over the next one. And then uh, Lewis, you need to, if you've watched the original series of Evangelion, you really haven't watched the show until you've also watched End of Evangelion. End of Evangelion is just freaking fantastic and it is my favorite movie. <laughs> this all really has so little to do with Warhammer, but oh well. Um, I mean, I guess that has to do with Slanesh because Evangelion is perfect like Slanesh.
Mm-hmm. And then, oh, the other thing I wanted to say was, I'm so sorry, I still don't have pictures up of No Step on Snack, my Herald. Those will be up soon. I'll get those up soon. I'll probably get them up tonight after I get done with this. Um, the other thing I wanted to say was... I think that's it. There's something else. I'll remember it later as I keep painting. But I will definitely post pictures of the Herald No Step on Snecky later tonight on Twitter. It's just a hassle to set up the whole camera angle and all that stuff, and like, I like to have good lighting on it. This new camera I have gets the job done, and I'm very appreciative of it because it was a gift, but I'm adjusting to it. It is not quite as nice as the camera I was used to before that I broke. That's my fault for breaking the camera. <clears throat> But Evangelion is not perfect, and it was such a confusing mess that I ranted on your Discord. I still don't understand what happened. Um, in response to that, congratulations. Evangelion is a very deep, deep story with a lot of mystery and a lot of tangles in it. And trust me, there are answers to all your questions. But... I mean, if it was a simple story where you got everything on the wor or on the first watch through, how good could it really be? But if you would like chaos, ask some specific questions, and I'll give you the best answer that I can. I'm curious as to what you don't understand. And it looks like, yep, I got all the flesh on this one done. Chaos, or wait, Ghost, you seem to think that Chaos is the first person to ever have a rant on Evangelion after watching it and being like, what did I just watch? What is going on? But you are the first person to do it on my Discord, Chaos, which makes me very happy. And then here I am, I'm just continuing on with the next demon at skin. Now I've heard of some people getting asked to leave stores because of these models, because like, they have boobs. I think that's so weird. Especially considering these are like actual GW done models. But I bet you it shows you what angle GW wants to go when the new demonettes that a lot of people don't like as much, which is unfortunate. Um, they don't have their breasts hanging out. They don't seem to have breasts at all, really. And some are like the ones that do only have one. Whereas I can actually call these ones girls without any confusion. As in, like, I can move them across the board and say the girls, my girls. I'll remove three or four girls. Okay, there's that. Last one of the troop. Getting her flesh.
There's a lot of subtle detail in these ones too. They all have nipples. They all have, like this one right here, she has a little Marcus Lenish right there. There's just a lot of detail that was given to these girls. I just, I don't know. For a while I told myself they weren't that much better because like I couldn't get access to them for the longest time. But now that I have some like in my hands, like oh my gosh, they are so nice. The older demonettes, like they just look way better. It's a bummer, it's so hard to get a hold of them now. That's the nature of it, I guess. GW wants to go a different angle for Slanesh. But it's like, I'm not even appealed to these girls because they're vulgar or anything. I just like them because they're prettier. If the new demonettes were prettier, I wouldn't care that they were, like, covered up. It's not a concern for me at all. I just want my demonettes to be alluring. I think I got her done now. Yep. So now that I've got their skin done, I'm going to go in the opposite direction. I'm going to do all the black of the rest of them. And then I'll do the purple. And then, okay, questions. Um, why was there a bunch of rays standing and smiling in Gatorade? And then why did people pop like balloons into Gatorade? Why is everyone Gatorade? That was my biggest question. I don't understand why everyone is apparently made out of Gatorade. Um, and why is... Why orange Gatorade? Well, you see, from the beginning of the show, they actually slowly introduce you to the concept of LCL. They fill the entry fluids with it in the beginning of the show, which is that stuff that Shinji has to breathe in in the first episode. You can see Ritsuko going across it in a, um, in, like, a raft in the beginning because she's, like, you can see scientists diving through it to work on the Eva, which is why when she first pops up to Shinji and Misato in episode one, she was wearing a wetsuit, actually, because she was diving in LCL. So you constantly see LCL pop up again and again, and they explain it throughout the show that LCL is the primordial soup of life, and that everything is, in fact, made out of LCL given form via the willpower of their souls. So... When the willpower of their soul is removed by a third impact, they pop because they're unable to hold their form and they revert to LCL. That is why everyone pops. Uh, why does Ray appear to everyone? Because Ray, Ray is uh, Lilith, and Lilith was the seed of life whom all the LCL that made the primordial life of Earth, except for the angels, came from. That's why you see throughout the show, whenever they show Lilith down in Central Dogma, she is bleeding an orange LCL, and they have to come to her in a, in like a, a raft and a boat made out of LCL, and there's an episode where you see them impaler with a lance, and you see, or no, no, I'm sorry, they pull the lance out of her. That was episode 22, when Ray has to pull the lance out of Lilith, and you see her, the Eva, just pushing through the shores of LCL, and you see, like, even ships rocking in it because the Evas are so big. So, like, that's what that is. That's the primordial soup of life. Um, and, and within Eva, they establish that without the willpower of your soul, the wall of your soul, your AT field, you will pop, and you will become nothing but that LCL. So... Once third impact happens and Ray pops out, she initiates an anti AT field. So, what that means is she's making it impossible for people to hold their forms. And the way that appears to people is a version of Ray comes up to you, touches you, and that's that's the anti AT field hitting you. When Ray touches you, your AT field dissolves, and that's her anti AT field hitting you. And you pop. So, there you go. I hope that answered your question, Chaos. Now I'm going to pull out some black 
and um, go ahead and start mixing that up and get it nice and watered down. For some reason this black is always so thick from GW, but it's okay because black is such a strong pigment. You can water it down really far and it'll still shine through. Or it'll still it'll still come through. So let's go ahead and water that down. Okay. So now that black is watered down and I will start. And I'm just gonna get all their little clothes, any spot like these gemstones. The gemstones I don't want black, but I want them to have a silver like set in, like a silver metal set in. And I always do my silvers with an undercoat of black. And I am going to have to do two coats of the black because it's pretty watered down. I'm going to do the armor right here black. Basically anything she's wearing is going to be black. Okay, so everyone is secretly the Kool-Aid man. Also, if you remember the scene where Reitz, Dr. Reitz go bring Misato into the basement, she presses a button and destroys all the rays. There are a bunch of the rays and the Kool-Aid. Why are they there? Because rays... Okay, this is where it starts to get a little weird if it hadn't already. Ray is not a human. Ray is the cloned body of Lilith. Which is why in the end, when you, in third impact, you see the giant ray, that's Lilith. Ray is not Lilith. Or Lilith is not Ray. Ray is Lilith. So the ray you see in the show is a little miniature form of Lilith. They literally tore off of Lilith. So when you see Lilith in some of the episodes, and I'm struggling to come up with a specific episode right now. If you give me enough time to think about it, I can pop up with it. But it's irrelevant. The point is, there are scenes where they show Lilith. In Central Dogma, and you can see little legs and bodies coming off of her disemboweled bottom half. And what is implied here is that the way you get a ray is you take one of those like disemboweled bodies that's falling out of her and you just pull it the full way out, and then you get a ray. And then that ray is, as you saw in the episode, they just they're soulless and they float in the water and they do nothing until you put a soul into them. And if you want to know where Ray's soul came from and what Ray's soul is, well, that's, that's another question. But the reason there were a bunch of Ray's in there is because Ray is a soul, or Ray is, in fact, a soulless clone of Lilith, literally torn from her body. And until a soul is put into her, she has no personality whatsoever and is an automaton. Not even an automaton, she just floats there. And this is all backed up by, uh, if you go watch Ritsuko's monologue, she explains this in more dramatic terms. We'll say dramatic terms. Hmm. Is Lilith the state puff marshmallow man? Um, kind of. 
And I thought Ray was supposed to be a reincarnation of Yui. No, Ray is, like I just described, she's that empty vessel, and then the soul they put into her was the soul of Yui. So Ray is, excuse me, excuse me, that's wrong. Give me a moment here. It's Lilith's soul that is in the little Ray. The reason you pull off the little Rays and you get the body of Rays. <laughs> I'm so sorry. We have to go back a little bit. Let me fully explain this to you, Chaos. Let's go back. Let's go back to when Yui made her contact experiment with Unit 1. Uh, what you need to understand is they show this in a cross-section. I can show you the picture in Discord afterwards. That Unit 1 was created much the same way as I just described for the rays. Unit 1 was they took Unit, or they took Lilith, and they just dragged her out. And then another body started appearing. And then that body, eventually, when they disconnected them, became Unit 1. But while they were still attached, whilst those two things were still attached, while Unit 1 was still attached to Lilith, that is when Yui did her contact experiment. So at that point, that body is joined, and it has the soul of Lilith within it, right? Still following me? Um, and so upon, Lilith enter or so upon Yui entering it, she decides to become one with the Eva. And she decides to have her body and soul disappear so that she can go in there. And she says, so now there's Lilith and Yui floating around in there. So the first thing that they try to do, that Nerve tries to do, is they try to reform Yui in the exact same manner that they used to get Shinji back in episode, I want to say, 19 or 20. Um, and that's where they describe this whole process to you so that you know this is how they did it for Yui. The difference is Shinji wanted to come back. So when this happened, Shinji did come back. And you see, we have the scene where he's crying in Misato's arms and he says, I only wanted to see them again. Um, in Yui's case, this is not what happened. Yui did not want to come out. So what happened was, is they ended up reforming Yui's body. But the soul they got out was Lilith's. So Rei is the body of Yui. Because that's the way they reformed her. And she has the soul of Lilith within her. Because that's the soul that came out. Because Yui fought to stay within the Eva. Um, so when you see in the end there, you've got Unit 1. And they're talking to it and stuff. There are actually scenes where Gendo talks to Yui. Or talks to Unit 1 directly as Yui. So that's where Yui is. Um, and then Lilith is within Rei. So the reason the rays you pull off of Lilith right now are soulless automatons is because there's no soul in them. And the reason there's no soul in them is because they pulled out the soul of Lilith and they put it in the clone of Yui trying to get Yui back, but they got Ray on accident. And then Yui's soul stayed within Unit 1 when they separated the two. <clears throat> the and then the reason they come out as rays, which are versions of Yui, is probably just a by or it's it, it it is without a doubt it is. It's a byproduct of the fact that the first time they tried to do that process to recom or remake her body, they used the pattern of Yui to do so. <coughs> Excuse me. So yes, all the rays are empty. They are empty clone, or they are empty pieces of Lilith that were in Yui's form. What was the first impact? What was the second impact? What did the second impact do to the world? First impact was when Adam hit the world. <laughs> so we got to go way, way back with this one, Chaos. In Evangelion, there was a first ancestral race. We don't know anything really about this first ancestral race, except they probably looked like humans. Um, and they made Adam and Lilith, who were seeds of life, and they were their attempts to seed the galaxy with life. And they put them in a giant starship, and I'm, I'm serious, this is literally the story. They put them in giant starships, and they sent them across the universe, or the galaxy, to populate planets. 
And each seed of life, when it came to the planet it was supposed to go to, would start, like, disseminating its form of life. Uh, some seeds presumably would be like Lilith, where we would get Earth-like life. And then some seeds would be like Adam, where you would get super weird alien life. So Earth was originally hit by... Oh, I can't remember if it was Adam or Lilith. Well, either way, it was hit by... It was either hit by Adam or Lilith first. I want to say it was Lilith first. Um, and then Adam came by... And Adam landed, and that's not supposed to happen. Two seeds of life are not supposed to land on the same planet. So, as a backup maneuver, as a fail-save in case this happened, the first ancestral race put a self-detonation mechanism in each of the ships. That is the Lance of Longinus. Unfortunately, upon entry, Adam's Lance of Longinus was destroyed. So only Yui, or not Yui, <laughs> only Lilith had her Lance of Longinus. So Lilith uses her Lance of Longinus on Adam, on the primordial Adam, and that's first impact. When Adam hits, uh, and he wasn't supposed to, he that's the impact that, according to Ebba mythology, creates the moon. And Lilith imbi or impales him with her own Lance of Longinus. So that he is put into dormancy. And then life is allowed to progress according to Lilith's model. And that is first impact. First impact is when Yui, or is when one or an extra seed of life hits Earth and creates the moon, following by the or by Lilith impaling Adam with a lance of longinus to knock him into dormancy. <laughs> this is where the story goes on acid, he says. Now, I would never do acid, and I would certainly never do acid and then marathon Evangelion. Just saying. Um, and on that note, second impact. So second impact comes around, and there is a, a scientist named Dr. Oh, Shoot, what was his name? Uh, they never actually give his real name, actually, now that I remember it. But Misato's father. Misato's father is an extremely renowned scientist. And he gets caught up by a secret organization that probably rules the world called Sele. And they say, we found something in the Antarctic. And we need you to come check it out. Well, what they found is in the year two, like, no, it's like the year 1990 or something. Uh, actually, I think in night or in Evangelion timeline, they find Adam in Antarctica in like 1930 or something. So, he comes on out to check it out. And I, I'm just fixating on this model because there's so little black on it. I'm like, there certainly has to be more, but that's it. She's good. Um... So he comes out to figure out what it is, and what they have found is they have found Adam impaled by the Lance of Longinus uh, in the Antarctic. So what they do, and this is the part where it gets a little unclear, where there are tons of different fan theories where people still aren't quite sure. No one's exactly quite sure what triggered second impact. The most common surface value th or surface value or the uh, surface explanation is they tried to remove the lance of longinus from adam and adam fucking exploded now that one doesn't quite make sense because the first thing you would think is that if you remove that from adam that he would just like start emerging life forms he wouldn't try to cause an impact he would just start releasing the angels and that is why he releases the angels as soon as they uh Stop his dormancy. He releases all of the primordial angels. And they all split off. They all jump out of his ship that they find him in. And that's why the angels keep coming back. That's why the angels are coming back in the show. Is because they, um, upon releasing Adam from his dormant state, he released the angels. And then that's the 15 years is how long the angels had until they were, like, fully grown and ready to start attacking the planet and you can see that kind of in episode 
10 Magma Diver, where they try to capture the angel in its embryonic form when they find it. <clears throat> and then, excuse me, taking a break, actually trying to paint these models. Um, but anyway, another reason that people say that Adam caused third impact is because they took the Lance of Longinus out. All the angels got released, so they tried to stick the Lance of Longinus back in, and they think that's what caused third impact, because they were like, oh, we goofed up, let's try to just not do that. Oh, nope, that made it worse. But, the theory I most believe that I think is right, because it's evidenced in the movie, is that impacts are caused by the fusion of one of the seeds of light, or both of the seeds of light in an elaborate, like, ritual kind of deal. So, what I think happened is, during the experiments, when they found Adam, they thought it would be a really great idea to try to stick human DNA in it. And I think that's what the Lance of Longinus is. I think that's why it's shaped like a helix, because it's supposed to be symbolic of them trying to inject it with human DNA, because because we'll see what happens. And that is how you got to the third impact, or the second impact. Now, what they also say is that they had to cause the second impact because it was the way to cause the least damage. And what that means to me is that if Adam had awoken and they had let Adam, if they had not done second impact, now this part is a little bit, or is pretty confirmed. Second impact served a second function of reducing Adam to an embryonic state. So, third impact upon with the Lance of Longinus and all the, the ritual they did that caused second impact. They were able to reduce Adam to an embryonic state, which you can see. Um, Gendo holds it uh, after Kaji brings it to him in episode 8. When Asuka shows up, Asuka strikes. The reason the angel attacks the convoy is because the real... And the real reason that Asuka's on the convoy and Kaji's there is because they are bringing the embryonic Adam to Nerve HQ. And then you also see episodes, by the way where they go to Antarctica with Gendo, that's them retrieving the Lance of Longinus. And then, was Reachsko's mom actually in the computer? It's hard to say. I go back and forth on this one. It's really hard to say. And then, now you're asking in episode 24, Karu says Gendo is like him. What does that mean? So in episode 23 or 24, Gendo takes the primordial atom and he sticks it into his palm. You can actually see his palm fused with the thing. Uh, it's actually one of the repetition episodes of the hand. Evangelion constantly has a hand out like this with different fluid and stuff on it. Like you see Shinji with blood on it. You later see Shinji with... Um mucus on it mucus from his body and then you also you'll see uh, gendo's hand in the same pose with the primordial atom having fused into it so what karu is saying at that point when he says you're like me is that he's saying now that gendo is an angel um which is technically true because gendo has taken an angel into his own body which is kind of a feminine theme now that i think of it taking something into your own body but that's a different topic so anyways, that's what Karu means. And Karu says the exact same line to Rei, because Rei isn't human either, if you remember. Rei is also an angel. Or she's a muted form of an angel. Clone of an angel. Point is, she's like him. Oh, and the reason that Karu says that is because Karu is like the Adam version of Rei. So no one knows where Karu's body came from, but we know he has the soul of Adam in there. The most common, the most, I think the fan theory that has the most credibility is that Kaoru is the clone form. If there, if there is a character that Kaoru's body is a clone of, it's Misato's father. Not to say that Misato's father is in any way alive or anything, but 
Kaoru's blo- or Kaoru is probably in the same way that Rei is a clone of Yui with the soul of Lilith. Kaoru is a clone of uh, Misato's father with the soul of Adam. So when he walks around telling characters like Gendo, who's in- taken an angel into himself, and uh, Rei, who's an angel herself, that they are like him, that's that's what he means. They're not human. Yeah, he did have uh, blood on his hand, but it wasn't in scene one, it was in scene like four or five. Now I don't know my Eva scenes offhand, forgive me. I'm not down to that level of expertise quite yet. I'm just getting black on her collar here. It looks like I got her armbands. I gotta get her ankle. Oh, my stomach is growling. I have to eat. Might cut this stream short again. I'll try to at least get, come on, I can get the spacing done. The space coding done. At least. Okay, there's two of them done. <laughs> Watching the show now, let's see how deep the rabbit hole goes. It goes deep enough to where, like, uh, you can't talk about how deep it goes. <clears throat> Why didn't I eat beforehand? I did. Earlier in the day. Now it's dinner time. Oop, you know what? I did forget one thing on the other one. I forgot her knife. We'll get that after I get this one. And I am painting the knife black because that matches what I've been doing for the rest of the army. Now, Chaos, you're fine to have your own opinions on this show, but discouraging people from watching it, I just will not tolerate. Evangelion is uh, pretty much the most amazing thing ever created by a human, and everyone should watch it. It is genuinely my favorite show. It's genuinely my favorite story. My life is very easily summarized with the statement, I love NGE and Slanesh. NGE being Neon Genesis Evangelion, or er, Neon Genesis Evangelion. Nothing else really matters. The only story that I think that exists on the same scale as Evangelion is Dune by Frank Herbert, the novel. And I, I do love Dune. 
And some of you may notice that there's a copy of it in view behind me. I don't know if you can, yeah, you can kind of see it poking out over the top of my head, but you probably can't make out which book it is. But that is a fantastic book. If you have not read Dune, you should do that. Dune inspired a lot of stuff for Warhammer. And it's one of my favorite book series, if not my favorite book series. I think it's the greatest science fiction novel ever written. So definitely check it out. <clears throat> The only scenes I will admit were badass, were drop, synchronized, drop, kicking, robots, Oscar versus all the weird angel demon things, and Pen Pen being a fucking badass. Okay, the last one never happened, and second off, the best parts of Evangelion are all the psychological torture. <clears throat> the scenes where characters are like... Screaming and agony and emotional torment, I love. Those are my favorites. Like... The reason I love Eva, or the reason I love Eva, is because it is so emotional. <clears throat> the reason I love Oscar is because she's so emotional, and that's another thing that makes her genuine. Whereas another protagonist would bottle up their feelings and be a nice, happy self-insert fantasy for you all, where they didn't have personal problems, and we got to pretend that those things didn't exist. Evangelion instead addresses those and says, no, people are real and people have problems and people do not just get to handle traumatic situations in combat without having, like, a horrible psychological reaction to them. Eva's real, and it's so good. Other mecha anime are just, like idealized fantasy in comparison. I'm a greater Slaneshi demon of desire on that note, but I mean, sadism is up there too. Everyone loves torture and the warp. Would I want to see a mecha that's a cross between the units and the alien giants of freezing? No, probably not. Uh, Dune is amazing. I was enthralled with it growing up. Congratulations, Ghost, because that is a freaking amazing book. That book is so good. Same guy who got me to watch Eva actually got me to read Dune. Kind of funny. He was the Canadian dude from Alberta. I met him on StarCraft. I haven't talked to him in years. One of those online friends I just lost, I guess. But he did show me Eva. Forget me to watch it. All these one Diaz demonettes. Just making sure I got all of our armor right. And it looks like this one's pretty good. I can get all the gemstones. Our collars are a little hard to get to, too, but it's not a big deal because, I mean, I can always black wash them. <clears throat> okay. 
And there's the third one. And what do I mean? Pen Pen was never a badass. When Oscar was freaking out, Pen Pen didn't care. He just went to his freezer. When Shinji wouldn't get in the robot, Pen Pen didn't give him no shits. You're right. What was I thinking? Pen Pen is clearly the best character. And then I was going to answer your question there, Ghost, but I, I don't remember what it was before you redacted it. Greater demon of desire, do I fulfill desires or do I just desire everything? Okay, no, I fill other people with desire and then I feed on your desire. And then I also have an unwarranting, unquenchable desire. I, I desire to please and sate and amuse Slanesh. Uh, let me rephrase. I desire to satisfy Slanesh, and it's impossible. So I guess you could say I'm a demon of impossible, wanton, like, hopeless desire. I fill your heart with want, and then I feed on that. I feed on you wanting things you can never have. <clears throat> like, for some of you, these demonettes, that's a good example. Because these things are super expensive, and, like, I was in that boat where I, like, looked at them with disdain because I knew I would never get them until I got super lucky and I actually got some. <clears throat> and, I mean, I've had my demon, or I've had my Slanesh army for years until I got these. Like, these really are just, like, a treasure. She doesn't, oh, no, she does. She has an earring right here. Oops. She also has the shoulder guard. Gendo best dad gave his son a chance to be or to have quality time with his mother. That's not a bad point. It definitely wasn't his intention though, and I think motivation is more important when it comes to deciding like if someone's good or bad or not. Because let's be real, if Gendo cared about Shinji, like, seeing his parents, maybe he could have been part of his goddamn life. Back on the Warhammer things. I love these demonettes. They're fantastic. Making sure I got all the black. I didn't. I have to get this arm sleeve. Let me make sure I got everything. I'm going to get our earring. Okay, there's that. <clears throat> I 
Where did I get my demonettes? I had someone send them to me as a gift, actually. I was very, like I said, that's why I keep saying I was super lucky because on my own, I never would have been able to attain these models. <clears throat> They're out of print and you kind of really do just have to get super lucky to get them. And I'm just continuing on with the black. You know, they have, like, a lot of leather straps that I've been leaving out for no reason because I'm like, oh, I'll come back in and get them with a different color. It's like, what color am I going to get them with? It's all going to be black. I'll just have to remember to get that when I go over them with the second coat. No amount of Game of Thrones has made K or Knight hate a character more than Gendo. While it's not fair to compare Hideki Anno to J.R.R. Martin, Hideki Anno is kind of out of his league. And then, would I like to see um, an incarnation of some 40k characters in a, or a 40k in an anime setting? I love anime. Uh, not actually. I just love the art. So, like, 40k characters with anime art would be, like, a dream come true for me. What I really, really want is I want, and I've talked to it about it a couple of times with a few people. I don't feel many people are also receptive of the idea, but I think it would be super cool. Is I really want a Yu-Gi-Oh! ripoff show where it's, like, they're all playing 40k instead of Yu-Gi-Oh!, though. The last time I brought it up, someone joked, they were like, oh, we could have four hour long episodes. And I'm like, come on, if we can get a battle report down to 40 minutes, we can get an episode or we can get a kid's show about 40K down to 20. And I'm just getting all these areas that are going to be black. Getting this little gemstone right here. I'm going to get the inside of this bangle. Okay, I think that's good for her. Last one for the black. Um, specifically high school anime, they're 99 point. Okay, um, actually, like, as much anime takes place as high in high schools, like, I'm a terrible person, and one of my guilty pleasures is I love slice of life high school anime. Like, why do we have to have super powers in our high schools? Can we just have regular high school stuff? Like... I just feel it's so ridiculous. Like, every high school anime is actually, like, some weird, crappy shonen hidden in there. Everyone has, like, superpowers, or they're a martial artist or something, and it's like, look, do we really need that angle? Is there not enough drama in high school already to make an interesting show? Are the themes of growing up and coming to, like, terms with your adult body not enough? 
Is discovering what love is not a good enough theme for the season of a show? Like, seriously, no, we have to throw in, we have to throw in ninjas and, and magical powers. Like, okay. Also, hello, Strawdust. I'm going to start thinking of your name as being, like, straw, like what you feed farm animals, and then dust. And I have to say, um, Stardust was a bit funner. Strawdust works, too. I really like... Carl Sagan, and this is this is going somewhere, this is relevant, I swear. And he has that famous quote where he's like, we are all made out of star stuff, or stardust. I think it actually is star stuff, but stardust was close enough, or stardust was close enough. And then, Chaos, if you're still around, you have any other questions about Eva, feel free. Otherwise, I'm just going to keep working on getting the black or the black and metal parts of these demonets to be the right color. Oh, it was an old Facebook fad, okay. <laughs> Is that the new Monster Hunter Strawdust? Um, I know a ton of people have been talking about it, but I don't own a console, so I haven't touched it. Sorry to disappoint some of you, but I actually, yeah, I don't own consoles. I'm a PC gamer. PC only, in fact. I do not do consoles. I did when I was younger, before I could afford a PC. Now that I can afford a PC, why would I do consoles? It's also just kind of my style. Like, I get there are exclusives out there. Like, I almost got a Wii. This shows you how behind I am on consoles. I almost got a Wii U for the remake of <clears throat> uh, The Wind Waker and Pikmin 3. However, I did not, because I was like, eh, I'm not going to spend that much for two games. And thankfully, eventually I did get to play both of those games, and I did eventually beat Pikmin 3 at someone else's house on their Wii. Because I loved the Pikmin games as a kid. I'm going over this model. Looks pretty good. Okay, I'm going to start over. Do the second coat of black over all these girls. I mean, it could also come out with PS3. I have a PS3. <laughs> to give you another inference of how old or how far back my gaming goes. Like, I... That's my newest console, is a PS3, and you want to know why I got it? I got it for the launch of The Last of Us. And I bought it used. 
on Craigslist for like maybe 120. And I don't remember the one that was. That was right before The Last of Us came out. That was like 2013. Sorry, I'm just getting these straps here. They're a little tiny and hard to hit, right? <laughs> so like when it was actually a thing where PS3 was against Xbox, I was Xbox. Um, like I had a 360 over a PS3 up until Last of Us came out. And only when Last of Us came out is when I switched over and said, screw the Xbox. I'll get the PS3. And I had an Xbox over a PlayStation 2 as well. So don't mistake me for being a Sony fan. Don't misjudge me. Or I am not. I just thought Last of Us was going to be cool, and I hadn't played on my Xbox in, like, four months, so. And then I think this demon, that's good. Move on to the next one. Yeah, Halo is what made me go Xbox as well, actually. I feel like Halo is the only reason that they were ever able to... Looking at it objectively now in the past, like, yeah, Halo is the only reason Xbox ever competed with PS3. Or PlayStation at all. Now people are making fun of Nintendo big time because they're going for, like, handhold systems and stuff. I think that's funny. <laughs> <clears throat> I don't blame Nintendo for where they're going though because like the handheld market is where they're winning and I don't blame Bethesda for re-releasing Skyrim a bazillion times because like people love Skyrim for some stupid reason even though Oblivion and Morrowind were both much better I like watching the Cantina. He's another YouTube channel. And literally all he does is talk. <laughs> he just talks about how much better uh, Morrowind and Oblivion were than Skyrim. And I freaking love his content because he's so right. I hate. Like, don't get me wrong. Skyrim is a very, very good game. Um, it's a fantastic 10 out of uh, 9 out of 10. Um. One of the best open world RPGs out there. But for long term fans of the series coming from Morrowind and Oblivion like I was, it was just a disaster. They cut out so much stuff. Whilst the gameplay was more streamlined and like in some ways objectively the gameplay is a lot better. It like there was so much loss from an RPG aspect. It was it was very sad. It was like the game got hacked apart. Hmm. <sighs>
I have a 3DS, and I like my 3DS. Um, I barely ever touch my 3DS, however, now I'm met, because I barely ever play video games. The main reason I was in Nintendo's handhelds is because when I was a kid, I freaking loved Pokemon. I actually loved Pokemon up until I was, like, 22. I still love Pokemon, and the only reason I don't consider myself a current fan is because I have not kept up with the last two generations of games. It is... It has flown past me. This isn't the first time it's happened in my life. Like, when I was a teenager, I stopped playing Pokemon for a while, so maybe I'll go back to it one day, but I think this is the last one. I think I'm done with Pokemon. I think I've gotten a little too old for it, and the games are getting a little repetitive. <clears throat> Which I feel is the issue with another one of Nintendo's handheld games, or handheld game series, uh, Fire Emblem. I really like the Fire Emblem games. I think they're fantastic but the actual gameplay has not evolved much at all. It's gotten more streamlined with more creature comforts, but the actual gameplay has not evolved since the original game in, like, the 90s. <clears throat> and I would love to have Oblivion with Skyrim graphics. I would love to have Skyrim, or uh, Morrowind with Oblivion graphics. I would take either. I would take Morrowind with Oblivion graphics. That would be good, too. I really do freaking love all of those games. So now we're on to this demonet. Wait, did I get their earrings? I'm gonna double check them really quick, make sure I don't forget their earrings. Okay, no, they didn't have earrings. <laughs> Stardust, Stratus, says that they would rather collect Warhammer figures than Pokemon. I'm inclined to agree. But Pokemon will always be a fun, magical part of my life. I love Pokemon when I was a kid. I have Pokemon plushies that I will never get rid of because I love plushies. I have a Haunter plushie in specific that is just super to die for. It is such an amazing little plushie. It's actually a huge plushie. I can carry it like a baby. If you all don't know what Haunter is, then I don't know. I guess you never played Pokemon. Because <clears throat> that's really easy. That's the first. I figured, like, everyone knew first-gen Pokemon, but I guess I'm just a nerd. Okay. Let's see if there's any more areas of black that need to be redone with her. I think this one is pretty good. Make sure. Oh, yep, she has an earring I need to get. Moving on to the next one. Getting this chain thing she has around her chest. Getting her collar. Bracelet. This anklet.
leather across here. I'll get this chin again. I think that foot is good. I think she is good. Put her aside, pull out another one. Am I gonna paint their flesh shaping? They're flesh shaping. I don't understand. Like, they're flesh? Yeah, I'm gonna paint their flesh. Do you mean, like, am I gonna paint people flesh shaping? And to that response, I have... <clears throat> I have a couple models with, like, strewn skins across them. But flesh shaping... How am I gonna paint their flesh? I'm gonna take that as the question, and that is... I am going to do it the way I did for the Herald last week. I'm going to highlight it up again with a, I don't think I'm going to do a dry brush of warp fiend gray, but I think I will just go in and do some manual white high or warp fiend gray and then manual like white dynamic highlightings at the very peaks of it. And it looks like, honestly, I might just get the base coating done for tonight because I'm already almost at two hours. And I still have barely gotten the black done for these six models. I just, I guess I don't paint very fast on camera because I'm trying to talk to you all. I'm also a very slow painter as is, so... What can you do? I guess speed up my painting is the answer. But I'd rather not. Okay, she has some straps I need to get. Oh. Here's the strap. Looks good there. I got her bracer there. I got her shoulder guard. I got her anklet, her knife, her other knife. Just get that again because it wasn't as black. And then we'll switch over to the last demon that's black. Hmm. Oh, how am I going to paint their claws? Okay. Uh, the way I tend to do that is I'm going to do them purple, and I'm actually going to have a shadow gray at the trans or transition. And then on top of the wash, it should blend it out pretty nicely. If I was doing this for, like, a character, I would do a full, like, blend for it. But since these are just rank and file girls, I'm just gonna let the wash and the dry brush blend it out. And then their claws will be purple.
Very purple. Okay, so there's the black. I know you're actually gonna get to see me do that, but before I switch over to the purple, now that I've got all the black and the flesh tone done, which I, I can't believe that took me an hour and a half for six models, um, hopefully my speed will continue as I keep doing this, but the other thing I need to do is I need to get on like some music on here, because I said I was gonna get music on here. I meant to have that on the last video. I don't even have it up this video, but I'm getting, I'm working on it. I have a playlist I'm putting together. So, <laughs> you run your Juan Diaz as his Heralds. Well, after the break, or Stardust, since you brought it up, I'll go ahead and bust out all my Heralds to show you, and we'll have a little gallery of that before I go ahead and do the purple, just as a bonus. So, I'm going to take a 15 minute break and then I will come back and I'm going to do the purple. Thank you all so much for watching and let me get the cap on this, wherever it is. That's a super important piece, I hope I didn't lose it. Well I know I didn't lose it, but anyway, um, I'll deal with that later. Anyway. 15 minute break. I will talk to you all in 15 minutes.
Okay, now I'm back to do the purple for these girls. And uh, I'm using the same brush as before, but I'm gonna go ahead and pull out some purple to add to, well, the models. Um, <laughs> go ahead and get that purple going. Start with Nagaroth Knight, I think that's the one, right? No, serious purple, that's the purple I start with. I'm gonna mix it with some water. Get a nice consistency on it. Pull back out my other brush and get to it. And I will go ahead and just do one after the other. And I think that what I'm going to do after I do the purple is I'll go in. <clears throat> I'll hit the gemstones just for a second there. And then I am going to go ahead and base these girls and show you all how I do that. And that is where I will call it for the night. Oop. So let's go ahead and get to it. I'm adding, making all these cloths purple. They're loin cloths. I'm gonna get her hair too. I want their hair to be purple. And you can see I'm kind of taking it where it like drags onto her face and pulling it back with that. Oh, my heralds, I'm so sorry. Let me finish this girl. I'll pull out all my heralds for you all. Forgot to do that, but let's go ahead and finish that. I'll finish this purple on this model, and then I'm going to pull out all my heralds for you all. I should really just... I'll put pictures of them up on Twitter, too, after this. We'll make that my next shoot. It'll be all my heralds together. So I've got like five of them. And then let me just get all the purple on her. All of her pretty tentacly hair. And then the rest of this cloth. I think that's all the purple. Oh, I gotta get her toes. <clears throat> Cannot forget her toes. And the cloth.
And then the purple on the front of the cloth tabard. Then is there any other purple that needs to be done on her? Not that I can see. So let me go ahead and bring out my heralds to show you all. So I'll be right back. I have them right over here. So, I have a total of seven heralds, first of which we saw our last week. Here's this one. You've got my Herald of Slanesh on Steed of Slanesh with a banner to end all banners. And then I've also got, besides her, moving her aside, oops, I've also got Another Herald, I just made her out of like plastic bits from a couple kits. I gave her steed a little bit of um, bile there. And I, I mostly designate her as the Herald with the head and with the spear. But I wanted a second mounted Herald. I didn't want to spend all the money on getting another one of the steeds over there. And I wanted that to be unique. So I just made her out of parts. That is probably my most boring Herald. Uh, this Herald was made with a demonette hand, um, a succubus head from Manta Games, and then the body is that of a of one of the pinup models from Kingdom Death, and you literally, you like, can't even, I don't think you can even get that model anymore. So, and then I have this set, and you may have seen them before. These are four individual models uh, from Raging Heroes. They were the first of the Lust Elves line, and I'll go ahead and put them so you can see them one at a time. Here's the first one. I can't remember their specific names because I got them as the kit, but I tend to use this one as the mask because she's in, like, the weird ballroom dress if I use a mask. Otherwise, she's just a regular demon or a regular herald. So there's her. And... Uh, her face is a little horrific, but I really like her dress. And then my other Harold, this is, I've got this one. She's probably my least favorite, to be honest with you. Like, she's just kind of an elf general. There isn't a lot to her. She doesn't even look that demonic. She just kind of came with them. But I painted her purple and pink. She works. Um, and no, they're not very big from Raging Heroes. These are very tiny models. They are extremely expensive, too. So, and you can see her back, actually, like the free, or the uh, highlighting I did on the cloak work there. Uh, putting her aside, I have this Herald, who's my second favorite, I would say, where she's holding up the head that she's eating. Like, yeah, they're, these are the Raging Hero ones, Kingpin, so that's, I'm glad you recognize them, but they're what I use as my heralds. And then I, I really like this one because she's holding up the head like she's, like, licking it and stuff. And it's just really creepy and eerie. And then the last herald I have, who's my absolute favorite, this is the herald that actually got me to buy the set. Because I just, I love this model, how she's doing the backflip, how she has the huge cloak, her sword's going out, how she has the extra hands popping out. Like, I just think she looks fantastic. Like, I really love this model. This is my favorite Herald. She's my go-to first Herald that I use. Um, the only thing I don't particularly like about her paint job here is I notice it's a little highly shaded. I actually, you know what, while I'm right here, I bet you I can make it look a little bit better by adding just a dab of a flush tone to it. And it's already been varnished, so I probably shouldn't, but hey, why not? I mean, it's just a little bit pigment 
So let's see if I can do that. And yeah, I think that actually did add a bit to it. So this goes to show, so long as you're not like repainting the whole model, if you see a little touch up, even though it's been varnished, it's not too late. Unless you're like washing, because wash is gonna give that horrible glaze that I hate. Because GW wash is all glazy. It's glazy, glazy. Anyway, back to the demonettes I was painting. Purple of the demonettes, let's do this. Claws, here we go. All this is gonna be just purple. So much purple. And I'm gonna get the whole claw like that. Flip it over. Same deal. And there's the purple of that claw. I'll do the purple of the other one now. I'll get her hair right there while it's there. Yes, Corvus, I have one Diaz Demonettes. They are the best. You can't get them anymore, sadly. Unless you pay a ton for them. Painting her toes. Painting her hair. Painting her horns. Cutting her hair, nice and purple. I actually am, just to add some variation, I'm not gonna do every single demonette with purple hair. I'm going to do one, a very single one, with pink hair in this batch. And I'm not sure which one yet, the last one I get to. <clears throat> we'll let that randomness decide in of itself which one gets the pink hair. I was thinking of adding a black haired one into this batch, but I actually think I'll just add one black haired one into the next batch. Because I want the demonettes to mostly have purple hair, but I want there to be just the tiniest bit of variation. Just to make it not too super boring. Or super similar, like where they all blend together. Hmm. Oh, thank you so much, Corvus, for the compliment on my dress. And I agree, we really should, like, start opening up casts again to get one Diaz Demonettes because people would go crazy for them. 
If I had free access, I would buy, like, hundreds of them, because I think they look fantastic. I mean, I might not, because I already, at this point, have, like, 70 demonettes, and that's kind of a ton. I mean, that's enough. I could be wrong. I mean, I guess, if, I, if I'm truly Slaneshi, I should know that there, it's never enough. I can always use more. And her tabard nice and purple. Wow, this water, this purple is getting really watered down. <clears throat> and then, I don't think there's any purple left to do on her besides that. Just her toes and her claws and stuff. Her hair. So with that done, oh, let's make sure I get this tabard. Cause it like, eh, we'll get it later. But anyway, I'll, I'm coming back with the second coat too. So I do desire more of everything. I want more. I don't even know what I want more of, but I want it. More. And her hair. And the water is just, it's so thin. And like, you really, if you think your paint's thin enough, you're probably wrong. You probably need it thinner. You want it to be literally so thin that, like, <clears throat> let me show you how this paint pools on glass. Like, you're going to see it recede and pull away from where I put that down. That's where you want your paint at. Like, I'll do another one just so you can see it. Like, if you can even see it, like, recessing and pulling in, like, that's where you want your paint. That's when you know it's thin enough. Let me demonstrate too thick of paint on that note while I'm at it. So you can see these two receding and pulling away and pulling in. Here's what a thick paint does. See the difference? How the thick paint just sits there and it like keeps its texture. It doesn't fade in and dry from the outside in. It just probably hard for you to see. Like I'm looking at the camera now and it's not that great but I mean I hope that gives some demonstration like that's how I would look at it I really should get like a piece of plastic to demonstrate it on I mean I've got one over I'll I'll, I'll, I'll save that for another stream I'll keep painting the purple and the demonettes but anyway oops. watching me poison myself over here in the back of this tabard and you can even see this now you can like it's starting to show the thick paint the difference between the thick and the thin paint like
you always want the thinner paint because look at that it just comes out so nice and dry so nice and pristine or is this blob it doesn't recede at all and it's even like making like a like a crater kind of shape so it's where the thin paint is drying from the outside in it seems like the thick paint is drawing from the inside out and that's just terrible because then you're gonna see it we're gonna get like these ridged lines on top of here and it's just it'll just be freaking awful just freaking terrible I'm just continuing to purple over this one's hair. Getting this hair in here. And like I said, I hope these streaks right here give you an understanding of why thick paint is just the worst. The absolute most terrible. And now that that is starting to dry, like the thick paint is finally drying, like you can just. Like, yeah, it's got its pigment a lot thicker. Like, it's definitely, you definitely won't have to do two coats of that, but oh, oh gosh. It's got its own texture. Almost done with the purple on this girl. It keeps receding away, it's kind of funny. And the rest of her hair, I think we're getting close to done with her. <sighs> and with my base coats, I'm a little messy, but that's okay. Is really like the way I look at it, the point of the base coat is to get like the foundation of the color onto the model. You can go in and fix up the details later at detailing, which is your final step. But my standard painting mechanism, which is like, I, this is GW's now too, this is the model they try to get you to do, which is good because it's a really nice way to paint, is you do your base coat to get the color on 
you wash it to give it pigment and shading, and then you highlight it to finish it. And that's generally about how I do my models too. It's pretty simple. Sometimes it gets more elaborate, like what you saw with the Lady of Depravity, but unless you're doing like a 20 hour or 25 hour plus showpiece, that, that method works fine. And even then, it'll work fine for a 25 hour plus showpiece, but I mean, if you're doing a showpiece, it should be a bit above tabletop standard. <laughs> All right, so there's the purple on that demonette done. And then, like, just as a reference, like, just like, I don't know, I, I guess no one can actually see it, but like, Thick paint, it's just the worst. So continuing on. We gotta get the purple tabards, toes, and claws, and hair. Soon I will have to bring out more purple. I can hear the old woman who lives below me yelling at her husband right now, and it's kind of funny. Makes me realize why he makes jokes about how he can't wait to die. And then I think after this claw, I'm definitely gonna have to pull up more purple. Yeah, I'm gonna have to pull up more purple. <clears throat> Clean that brush off. I'm going to pull my other brush to pull the purple out. Water it down. And I can kind of already see it, but just to demonstrate, I'm going to test the consistency of the paint again to make sure it's thin enough. It's thin enough because I can see it receding. And that is always my test. If on a surface like this, the paint here, I'm going to use this one so it's even, it's easier to see it. Like, check this out. Thin enough. Where it just pulls back into a straight line like that. Too thick. Final demonstration. Just to show you the pristine paint I'm using for this. Oh, look at that. It just pulls away. Like, even if I make a nice thick line, it just, it wants to recede back in, and that's when your paint's thin enough. And if you do a good prime, the fact that it pulls back like that should actually work to your advantage because it should seek to fill out the surface because that means it's more viscous.
I'm just getting all of her hair. Actually, I like this one. She looks a little bit masculine. Just a little, I feel like. She's got like the shoulders and the chest pose. The other reason I really do, I don't know, I just prefer the one Diaz Demonettes is because they're actually freaking feminine. And that's why a lot of people prefer them. They are not Voldemort's. So it's actually funny you mentioned that. <clears throat> Creature caster. They always, like, on their demons, they have, like, no noses, and it's the weirdest thing. So, I, so I've given, well, both of them, both of my creature caster demons noses to avoid the, like, weird Voldemort face. I just tend to green stuff it. Just like I green stuff the hair on them. Which maybe is their intent, because I know like a lot of custom stores will sell like just base heads with no features on them for people to mold features on top of. But like I don't think there are a lot of master sculptors like that in the hobby. So I don't think that was Creature Caster's intention. I think they just wanted them to look less humanoid, more alien and weird. Which is they do them, they get to do it, they get to decide if they want to have it like that. But I get to decide what mine looks like. And mine will have hair and a nose. I like hair and noses. I like my nose, I like my hair. I don't think I'd be as big a fan of myself if I didn't have them. And she's got like a cloth <clears throat> on the front of her hair. I'm gonna paint that purple too. There's that. Is there anything else on her that needs to be made purple? I've got her hair. I'm gonna get the bottom of her hair again. All right, there's the purple on her. We'll move on to this one. <clears throat> the new demonettes are practically bald, and it's really weird. Like, I try so hard with the new demonettes when I've got them because I have I have 70 demonettes. I only have 21 Diaz demonettes. Do the math. That means I have a lot of GW demonettes. Um... 
And I always try to give them the heads with hair and stuff, but sometimes you run out and you have to give them the weird one. I even, I hate to say it, I have a demonette with a top hot, or a top knot in my army. And if you know me, you know, I just, I cannot stand GW's freaking obsession with top knots. That's the other reason, uh, I'll put her aside to pull this model out again. This girl right here, I gave her a custom head specifically because I wanted her to have hair. Like... Demons don't have hair in Warhammer. I don't understand it. It's so weird. So anyways, back to this. Let's paint some claws. And then now this means that this girl will have purple hair and then the last one will have... Oh, thank you so much, Stratus. They're saying I have a cute nose and cute hair. I, I am very happy to hear so. But anyway, I want my demonettes to have cute hair and noses too. Which is why the new GW models are like weird because some of the demonettes are even bald. I don't understand a bald demonette. How is that supposed to be? I... I guess Warhammer's a weird setting. Uh, the Remembrancer and Horus Rising, she was bald. She was super weird looking. She had like super dark skin and then she extended her head back and she was bald. I imagine like, like those pictures of the old Nubian royalty, like where they had the really like long pulled back heads that they would stick into those huge weird elaborate headdresses. But it's like their heads were deformed like that due to like, like royal inbreeding or something. But yeah, my point there is that sometimes 40k likes bald women, I guess. Because the remembrance from Horus Rising rocked being bald with like a weirdly oblong head. And <clears throat> she was also described in the book as being pretty, so <laughs> whatever works for her. I personally, though, my personal taste is I like, I like my demonettes with hair. And I just realized I forgot to make this knife black. I'll have to do that after I get done with her purple. But that happens. Mistakes happen. Let's see, she's even got a horn. And I'm just getting her hair. Her hair's these these girls have like the tentacle hair like the Lady of Depravity. But it's not as bad as the Lady of Depravity's because it's actually a solid piece of the metal. Whereas the Lady of Depravity's was like a sponge where there was like it was like a porous thing where I laid down every strand of hair so like the paint kept seeping into it like a sponge and I had to keep applying more and more and more and it just... Thankfully this is not the case for the demonette hair. And honestly like I want to get more of these demonettes painted too because I just think they're pretty. I think they're super pretty, and, like, I don't know. I've just been going crazy with the Slanesh Demons in 8th edition. I'm normally... I used to be more about the Chaos Space Marines, because, like, I have all variations of Slanishy Chaos. I literally have, like, every Slanishy Chaos unit there is at this point. Like, the last thing I didn't have was Fiends. I got some Fiends recently. We're done. I have every single Slanesh Demon around. I have all Slanesh Forces. Um... I have chariots, I've got seekers, I've got keepers of secrets, I've got an exalted keep, I've got two exalted keepers of secrets, I've got K 
Chaos Space Marines of Slanesh. I've got freaking Terminators. Of, I've got every type of Marine for Slanesh. I got Renegades of Slanesh. I got, I got all of it. And lately, I've just been preferring the demons. I really like because it seems like Eighth Edition wants Slanesh to be the fast army, where I go fast and I hit first in combat, which is different than what it was before. Uh, before Slanesh, I feel, was more of a hybrid army where you were supposed to shoot them until you could assault them in combat. But now I don't feel it works quite that way. So I have definitely been much more demon heavy. I'm using a lot of demon heads and a lot of cultists. If I do use a Chaos Space Marine character in a game right now, like, that's generally it, because I have to take a couple Space Marine characters if I want to take cultists. Excuse me. So I'll take, like, a Sorcerer, an Exalted Champion, and call it a day. Take a ton of cultists, and then throw a bunch of demons on top. And that seems to, uh, get the job done. the army I've been enjoying playing anyway. The model I really like to play is I really love to take the Lady of Depravity now because oh my gosh it's so fun to take Zorakniel out. She's such a freaking powerful model. <clears throat> she just runs straight up to stuff going super fast and erases it because she causes 12 mortal wounds before they swing. It's awesome. But she's super powerful and that's why like I also can't play her too much because some people won't want to play against me. Same reason I don't take my Shadow Sword every game. Like, I play Imperial Guard too, I have a Shadow Sword. <clears throat> and the first time 8th Edition started, Guy Local up here was like, take the most broken list you can, let's see how balanced 8th Edition really is. So I took the Shadow Sword Death List with a ton of Guardsmen in front of it, and this was before Conscripts were uh, raised in price, and this was before Commissars and Inquisitors were nerfed. So, you add a Shadow Sword, and then, like, a bazillion Guardsmen that were never going to run away. Because there was a Commissar and Inquisitors who boosted them to Leadership 10, and they could only lose one model from morale if they were within six of an, or of an, or of a, of a Commissar. And it was, it was a little absurd. Just a tad. Now Commissars aren't worth it because it's they can only use that ability once per turn and it's like, oh, who cares? If it's once per turn, then I don't care. It's literally like a 50-point upgrade for a single infantry squad. And considering the infantry squad itself doesn't cost that many points, I'm not going to take it. I'm going to get her toes down here. There are toes. Let me get, uh, she still has a couple strands of hair down here I need to grab. Mean to nab. No mistakes, just happy accidents. I actually don't watch a lot of Bob Ross, ironically. Um... They had a couple of his episodes up on Netflix and I was watching some of them. He's definitely a fantastic painter. I'm not much of a landscape painter, though. I, I prefer to paint figures. Like, landscape painting is a lot like hobby, or is a lot like, like, mini painting. Like, especially watching Bob Ross, you don't see him doing stuff where he's, like, going in and making these, like, super detailed, like, precision lines. Like, no, there's a lot of different techniques that he's using together in a good combo so that he gets a really nice-looking painting. And that's why I feel like it works really easy, where you can just teach people how to do it, where it's, like... Yeah, I'm not actually using, like, complex maneuvers or anything. So long as you can get these basic techniques down, you can paint like me. 
And I'm sure I'm sure he's capable of much, much better stuff, but you know. He paints for an audience. Let's see. Okay, I think I got her purple done. So this last one, I'm gonna do all the purple on her, except her hair. I'm even gonna do her horn, <clears throat> but not her hair. Because her hair is going to be pink. Because she is gonna be different. So my demonettes aren't totally uniform. And here I go, getting the purple in on the claw. Just continuing on. Got her hair while it's right here. Getting it over her head and, ah, oh, this is her hair. I just freaking goofed. Okay, I guess all six demonettes are gonna have purple hair. I lied to you all. I totally just goofed up. I wasn't even thinking as I did it, but oh well. It was meant to be. It was the will of Slanesh. She gets to have purple hair after all. I'll just have to do a pink and a purple hair demonette in my next batch. And what I'll do to be smart is since, because I always try to learn from my mistakes. This isn't really a mistake. I just wanted to add a little variation. It doesn't matter that she has purple hair instead of pink. But to learn from this, my forgetting of it, what I'll do next time is the next time I paint a batch of these demonettes, is before I do the purple, I will do the pink and the purple hair. Or not the pink, the pink and the black hair, because the next batch will have both a demonette with pink hair and a demonette with black hair. And I don't know what it is, I just, I really do love the hair that they gave these demonettes. All right, Stardust, I'll see you later. I probably won't be going on for too much longer. I just gotta get the purple done on here and then I'm just gonna show you all how I do basing real quick. I'm just pushing on with these demonettes. I'm just getting around her tabard. <laughs> Thank you, Stratus. Have a nice night. It was nice to have you in here. God, getting in there was a mess. I got all over the place, but... I'll just have to go back in with the warp fiend gray to correct that later. You'll see me do that in a second. So it looks like I've got the tabard, I got the hair, horn, claws.
Looks like she's good on her purple. I'm so tempted because I'm staring at those two unpainted heralds and I'm like, I should paint them with this batch since they're out. I'm just instinctively thinking about it. But I'm not gonna. I'll set her aside. We'll do the second coat of purple. And how long will I be streaming tonight? Probably another 30 to 40 minutes. I'm gonna do the second coat of purple, then I'm gonna show you all how I do the basing real quick. Oh, I have to do one other thing where I'm gonna really quickly do a blending layer to the purple claws. I'm gonna quickly do the gemstones. So yeah, about 30 to 40 minutes. Probably, yeah, not too much longer. I just gotta get the second coat of purple on. Make sure it's very pristine because I'm using such a thinned down coat. Hair down here. like the way this hair is like emerging from the area between her arm and her uh, waist. Same thing over here. Same thing up along her cloak here. Make sure I got all of her hair. Looks like I re-got all of her purple. Oh, I gotta get her toes. I forgot this one's toes completely. I'll double coat her toes right here, right now. Just to be certain of it. Push her aside, there's that girl's purple done. And the next one, move on to her purple. Get the claw, of course. The other side of it. Her hair. Get the cloak or the loincloth. Just keep on going with that loincloth. Make sure I get it nice and thick and solid. And the way to get things nice and thick and solid with a thin paint is by applying multiple coats. A little purple across her leg there. That's not a huge deal. Because again, this is base coating. <clears throat> the goal is just to get the pigment on the model. Have I ever thought of doing a Gundam model kit assembly and painting? I have not, actually, um, to be honest with you. For a couple of reasons. Uh, the biggest reason is I actually don't like the look of Gundams as giant robots. Like... They're an iconic design, and maybe one day I will do one, but as of now, I've never had an interest in Gundam, really. I've watched a couple episodes of a few that were pretty good, I admit, 
Uh, I had one guy get me to watch the first episode of Gundam Pegasus. It was fantastic, I'm not gonna lie. But it's still not my thing, and as much as it's ironic, like, I love Evangelion, giant robots aren't my thing. I'm not a giant robot person, and in fact, the giant robot aspect of Evangelion put me off it when I first heard about it, and I was like, I don't want to watch some stupid giant robot crap. But, lo and behold, I actually love it, so... <clears throat> would I? Yes. Uh, have I thought of it? Not really. Would I? Yeah, sure, I would. Like, you could always pay me and I would definitely do it. But there is an aspect of me that refuses to buy a model for any game unless I think I'm going to use it. Because unless, I just have this thing where I'm like, unless I'm using the model on the tabletop, I'm wasting my money. <clears throat> so as an example, I got a fleet or a squadron for Star Wars X-Wing. Still haven't played Star Wars X-Wing two months later. Starting to think that was a wasted investment. <clears throat> I don't really like owning toy soldiers just to own them. Some of these are the exception, but like... Most of the time, not really. Like, even the one exception to that where I got a model where I'm like, I might not play this, but I still want it, was, like, <clears throat> the Eisenhorn model. But even then, I can run him. And if I want to, and I don't like his rules, I can run him as a generic Ordo Xenos Inquisitor. And you're right, Ghost, I don't watch NGE for the robots. I watch NGE for the psychological torture. Because who doesn't love that? I'm sure all these girls I'm painting love that. I'm sure Slanesh loves that. And that's all that really matters. Getting the purple of her cloak. It looks like I have the purple of her talons down. It's actually a little, little coated on there. getting her hair again. I can try to put too much paint on this claw. She looks good. I will put her aside. I got two more. All right, no, I got three more. I'll let myself get tricked there. I'm gonna have to pull out some more purple, probably, too. Let's actually just pull out more purple right now. So, this is the wrong brush to do that with, and if you look, you can see that I got paint all over this area of the brush where it connects the bristles to the...
a handle. Um, I don't know proper terminology. I never went to art school, uh, but point is every second I let this dry is the second that I'm reducing the life of the brush. Don't ever do that. It's very bad. Um, if you have a nice brush, don't do what I just did. Do not use your nice brushes for mixing paint. Now I'm going to give this a very vigorous wash to make sure that, um, to try to repair the damage that has already been done from doing that. And I can just, I can already see it. There's just purple paint that's gotten in there and there's nothing that can be done about it. And yeah, sorry for that dramatic pause. Like I said, I never went to art school. I'm not like... I don't know the proper terminology. All of my art experience is like personal experience. My education is in science, so. Biology specifically. So continuing on, painting this demonette. This isn't watered down enough. That'll be better. Let's test it. Yeah, it's good. Not good enough there. So yeah, I was right. It's not watered down enough. Towards the other side. And see, it's fine to destroy your brushes if they're like $2 brushes you got from Walmart, but check this out. This paint is so thick, I can just be like, bam. Even though I already laid it down, like I could paint with that. I'm not gonna, but I could. Getting the claw, the cloak. I call it a cloak, but it's a loincloth. There's no debating it's a loincloth because the only thing it covers is her loins. Which is probably for the best because if people are bothered by the Juan Diaz demonettes breasts, they'd probably be really bothered if the loincloth was up and you could see her massive, gigantic, huge, freaking throbbing uh, inner thighs. No one would want to see her big, throbbing inner thighs. That would be lewd. Thighs are very lewd. Her outer thighs are fine, though, of course. Continuing on with her toes, her hair. Getting the hair, making sure I get it all. Couple uncovered spots. Okay, and there's another one where the purple's done. Two more. Her toes, her loincloth, her hair, and this knife that needs to be done.
Okay. There's her purple. Got her toes. One last one with the purple. So yeah, I'm getting there. We're almost done with the base coat in here. I wasn't too much more ambitious than I thought I was. I thought I'd be able to get the washing done too, but it looks like I'll have to wait in for that until the next episode, which is fine. We can all survive without base coating. Not ba or without base coating, without washing tonight. I got to show you all my pretty, pretty Juan Diaz demon hunts. I'd like to think you all enjoyed seeing them. Hopefully we'll enjoy them more next week when they are fully painted. It's weird to consider because at this point, I'm like, okay, we're just starting. Whereas, like, a lot of people, like, at this point, they'd be like, oh, three colors on it, tournament ready, let's go. Whereas, like, I don't want to show this model on the tabletop yet. But the last one? That's the last one. Okay, so... I actually have to get her toes. I forgot to get her toes. Reckon my back. Getting her toes. Making sure they're just right. Okay. Now that I pretty much got them. I'm gonna put her aside, I'm gonna pull this girl over, and I'm gonna fix that knife up. And then once I fix that knife up, I can go up and I can fix the other girl's toes. <clears throat> so knife. There's the knife. Let's get her toes. And now you might have noticed that these girls are on like some like Imperial Factorum floor, which they're really nice, pretty bases, but I don't feel they go with the demonettes very well. However, I think if I throw some gravel and some rubble over them, I think it will be more appropriate because then it'll be like they're invading a busted down Factorum. In which case, I think then it'll just add some nice little detail or bits of detail. So the first thing I'm going to do actually to do these bases is because I actually do want the undercoat to look metal. I'm going to take a silver and I'm going to put it over there. And I'm actually going to go ahead. Excuse me. <clears throat> I'm not even going to black undercoat the base. When I do this for a really specific reason. And that's because like, I don't care. Um, the base, like... It does not require a high quality. It just does not. 
So I'm gonna go ahead, take a bigger brush, like one of these, and I'm gonna take <clears throat> Rune Fang Steel straight out of, oh, that's way too watered down, messed up. Let's get the right one. I have lots of lead belcher, but apparently no freaking Rune Fang, and I want Rune Fang, here it is. Rune Fang is like a natural steel color, so that's working gray. Here we go. And I'm just gonna take the silver directly out, and I don't even care if it's thick on there, because guess what? It's the base. If it adds texture, that's great. The base should have texture. Let's just put some silver on top. Really make that manufacturer and floor stand out. Let's do it some more. And again, it's pretty thick, but I texture is okay for basing. That's why GW literally sells paints that are texture paints for basing. Next one, same deal. There's that one silver, and then we'll do this one. This one actually is like dirt and stuff, so I'm gonna leave it alone. But these ones are both manufacturing floors. Kind of. And if I get it a little thick, that's fine. It'll just look like grime when I do the final basing. <clears throat> There's that one. One more. All right, and there's the silver of all those bases done. Now I'm gonna do the next thing. How's the painting? The painting is going fantastic. And then Cups, if you want to come over in like an hour, that would probably be good because I'm about to finish this up. But anyway, I'm going to take now the blending color, my blending color, which is shadow gray, which is, I don't even think you can get this paint anymore. Mine is really watered down, which makes it ideal for this. And I'm going to do this for the claws specifically in the hair start with this girl and I'll show you how I'm gonna do it. Take a dab of the shadow gray. Da, 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 da. Just push it on in there and around and on the other side. Same deal. And I'm just gonna keep doing that around the claws and at the base of the hair like right around here. And the other claw. I'll pull on here. And there's the shadow gray for her. And that's just a nice little blend shade. Next one will do her. Oh, 
I'll do up over here. And this is just a quick application of shadow gray to the base of where the purple meets gray. Push that over, and it's just, I'm just doing it to the hair and the claws. And then, yep, base of her hair, got it, push her over. Next one, shadow gray, base of the claw, base of the hair. And like, and cups, regardless of if they took it or not, that doesn't change the fact there's no parking where you're at. And then pushing on, getting through this next one. Same thing, base of the hair, base of the claws with this light tone of shadow gray. Which I'm not sure what color this is now. I know GW has a new word for it because this is the old GW version of it. It's a very, it's a purplish gray, but it's slightly darker than Orc Fiend gray. Which makes it a nice transition shade between the purple and the Orc Fiend gray. Over here, and then she, I just have to get around the base of her hair. She is using two knives. But I'm gonna have to get along her face here because she's got this horn going really across her face. Um, okay, and there's that. So there's the shadow gray. Now, I'm going to pull out a blue and do the um, blue, not, is it Slanish? I'm sorry, Warp Fiend Gray, excuse me. I meant to say Warp Fiend Gray. Their, their, their flesh is Warp Fiend Gray, and then I'm using the Shadow Gray to fade that to the purple. And then I actually shall go ahead and pull out a blue. Not that blue, a Latoc blue, and we're gonna get the gemstones, and I'm actually gonna pull out the smaller brush for this part. Oop. My fine detail brush. Which is really, really not very wet right now. I'm intoxicating myself. <clears throat> okay, now we'll do this one at a time, checking them for their gemstones. They've all got them. When this blue is too thick, I'm actually going to have to pour it out and make it a bit thinner. I thought it would be fine, but you always got to water stuff down. Cleaning this brush. And anyway, back to what I was doing. 
Let's get some blue on some gemstones. Does she have any other gemstones? Yes. Every one of these girls has a bunch of gemstones hidden somewhere. That's all her gemstones. Get this girl's gemstones. I think that, oh, I gotta get these ones. I think that's all of her gemstones. Next girl. <laughs> Do these gems have Eldar souls in them? Like what else would a demon's gems have inside it? What else could they possibly contain? Every single one of them has a bunch of them, too. Flipping her over, it looks like this is all of this girl's gemstones. This one. She's got the two gemstones there. She has a couple on this bracelet or on this anklet, I should say. Does she have any others? Yep, she's got a necklace one. And then what else? Looks like she's good. This one. Gemstones right here, right there. Does she have any others? Yeah, she has this bracelet or this anklet with them. Oh, and she's got a couple right here. Let's see. Are there are any others? I don't think so with her. I think that's good with her gemstones. Last demonette's gemstones. Oh, welcome back, or er, welcome back, Strata. So I'm almost done. Last girl's gemstones. Oh, I got a little bit of purple on her hair right here. I gotta get. Do that right now. She just has a couple little strands of hair that I missed. Gotta get them. Okay. Let me see if there's anything else. Nope, she's good. I got her gemstones. No, I didn't. Let's make sure I get her gemstones.
Okay. And that's it. There are all their gemstones, so the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna base them. And now let's pull them all out. So you can see the whole troop again. Come on. There's the troop again. Hmm. Yeah, I'm painting for a little bit longer, and on that note, um, I don't know, like, now, start, or Stratus, we got, like, always goes first, which is cool, I guess, and then here, I'm gonna show you all how I do the facing here. I have to pull this thing out. This is like a legit, like actual artist painting palette, and you can see there's this weird thick thing on it. You're gonna see why in a second. I'm gonna pull out a brush. That's a dead brush. As in, like this brush is dead. As in, I'll never use this brush again because it is dead. Because what I intend to do with this brush, not this brush. I have to find the right appropriate, appropriately dead brush. This brush is good. You can see this brush, it's like so rigid, I can't even move the bristles. You're gonna find out why, because what I'm about to do literally like kills the brush so dead. So, so dead. But you kind of have to do it for proper basing and stuff. So, I'm gonna take some tacky glue. I'm just gonna pour this shit out. That's probably too much, but whatever. Look how thick and gross that is. What am I even doing with that in mini hot or in, or with minis? This brush doesn't even hold water. I like have to take my paint water brush or my paint over here, my paint pot, and just be like, pour that in there, water that up that much, get this into there. I just gotta mix this up. This is literally glue and water I'm mixing up here. And it doesn't want to mix, but you can get it to mix. And this just, whatever brush you do this with, it's gonna kill the brush. It is gonna kill that brush. What I'm gonna do now is this brush is just free. Now this brush is trash. Um, but anyway, I'll pull out another one that's also a dead brush, like this one. This is dead brush, this is good dead brush. And I'm gonna take it, I'm gonna take this, oop. Gotta be careful with that. And I don't want the entire Demonette's base to be like covered in this. So I just, I'm gonna dab it in there a bit. Be careful not to get any of this on the Demonette herself. And that's pretty good there. So now, I'm gonna take out this pot that I have, which has all my basing material in it. And you can see it's a nice, like, set of grapple in there. Take the girl. And I'm gonna set her in there, and I'm just gonna let her sit there for a little bit. I'm gonna do the same thing with the next girl. Pull her out because her base was like more or less metal. Just pour some paint in, or not paint, this is glue. Water down glue and just get it all up on that. And I'm actually trying really hard not to cover the whole base because I want some of the detail to come out. I'm gonna pull the other demon head out, shake her off just a tad, put her right here. Do the same thing. I'm 
And I'm just going to repeat this four more times. So four more times I got to do this. Or in here, do the same thing again. Ooh, I didn't mean to do that. I'm going to have to clean after I did that now because I accidentally got dirt all over the table, but whatever, it happens. Same deal. There's the third one in. Ooh, let's get her a little better. One second. Yeah, I dropped something in the shag carpet. It's just... Shag carpet is the worst for whenever you lose something. So anyway... I'll have to clean the table up a little bit. Ooh. <laughs> there was some Nuln oil ominously on its side there for a second. But that'll happen. So moving on to the next demonette. Same deal, pull the last one out. Pour her in here. Same deal. And the last one. And so here's the deal, what I'm going to do after I do this. Because this is coming out kind of sloppy right now, but that's okay. Because the goal is I'm just trying to get dirt on the base. And then once I get dirt on the base, I'm going to take a blow dryer to it to blow off all the excess once I give the glue. I'm going to let it dry overnight. And once I've let it dry overnight... I will blow dry off the excess. Following blowing off the excess, I will, um, well, that'll be it. They'll be based, and then I will go in and I will wash them, and the wash will blend together everything, and then I'll do the dry brush like you saw with my other models where I base them. So, let's pull these out so you can just get a look at how they look right now. Uh, put this thing away. I'm going to wash that out. But yeah, here are the 60 minutes with the start of the base thing done. And it looks pretty eh. But I'm telling you, when it's done, it's going to look just like the base thing on this one. So, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and call it. Thank you all so much uh, for coming in and checking out my six-fold foundry. Uh, the next episode will be on Monday where I'm going to go ahead and wash these girls and then I'm going to detail these girls. And if I do it right, well, we should be able to get this done in two videos. But in all likelihood, it might be three. It always seems to be a video longer than I think. So I'm going to say two, but count on three. And with that, thank you all so much for tuning in for another Sixfold Foundry. I'm going to call it here. Thank you so much. Um, and I'll see you all on Monday.